Um, so welcome. Thank you to, uh, to everybody for taking the time this evening to join us in this important conversation. Um, I mean, really, in truth, it's just a great opportunity, you know, first of all, to hang out with Rabbi Hain. We, <laughs> it really is a, an opportunity. And for us to, to, to spend this important time together with you, Elliot, for, thank you for making the time. You know, you've been on, you've been on news interviews for the last week almost nonstop. And it's, uh, we, it's, uh, we feel like this is a home game. I want to just start off by articulating a little bit of the discomfort in, in this conversation, this dialogue. And that is, is the discomfort is, is are, we, are we really here as the jury? You know, do we, do we really have the right to be opening the docket and asking these questions? Is it up for every Shabbos table to reevaluate information of three decades? And yet I think it's potentially specifically for that point that this conversation is so important, is that this has been an issue which has, which un unfortunately has divided and may be in the conversation piece for so many for so long. And a lot of times when we arrive at certain, certain um, conclusions or assumptions, we tend to live with those assumptions. We tend to carry on living with those assumptions and finding new sources which corroborate those assumptions. And we, it's very hard to break that cycle. And only one, way, the, one of the only ways to break the cycle is to have a dialogue, is to actually talk. And so we have a great opportunity of having an individual like yourself, an outstanding person like yourself, who really has been on the in, inside track to be able to, to be able to help us, to get, for us speaking as, a, as the outsider, the layman on the outside who reads the news channels to get a real sense of what's going on. That's one perspective. Another perspective is not as the jury, but also just appreciating Elliot, not so much even Jonathan Pollard's side of things, but your side of things. Seeing what it's like to be the person who has stood up to the challenge, why stood up to the challenge, and how important it is the lessons that we can learn. So it's framing that discussion. I think that's just the, the, the framework of, of our, our discussion. Rahan, do you want to take it from here? Okay, thank you. So really, this is a great pleasure for me as well, and uh, to have the opportunity to with Rabbi Trump, who has become such a wonderful friend of mine and someone I, I really dearly love and respect, um, to talk to my dear old friend, not, not so old, uh, Elliot Lauer, who uh, known each other a long, long time. We were back in, even goes all the way back to the young Israel of Farakaway, to Yeshiva College, student council, and then uh, our next door neighbor on Waverly for many years. Um, and he and Marilyn and their beautiful four children and their amazing families are just uh, a bracha for all of us, especially for, their, for themselves. Um, so I would, I would jump in and uh, say this is a, a subject that I've been involved in, uh, at least at some distance, at times more involved uh, over the last 30 plus years. Um, I, we were, I've been at demonstrations um, I don't think I ever got arrested for protest for Pollard, but on other occasions I did. Um, and um, this has been a very challenging and controversial issue within the Jewish community, as well as in certainly in America and, and definitely in Israel. Multiple opinions about what Pollard deserves or doesn't deserve and I think the purpose of tonight for us is to kind of not just go by the sort of headlines or, you know, quick judgments of him or and of this story, but also to be able to have the opportunity to really drill down and, and get some of the full background over this long, very complicated issue. So, so maybe just if we could, Elliot, we could just start uh, before going all the way back to the beginning. How did you get involved with Pollard? Uh, how did that happen? When did it happen? And what's your involvement been? Uh, thank you, Rabbi Hain. Uh, I was approached by a client of mine who's a philanthropist, uh, well known in the Jewish community, who wishes to remain anonymous. In the early part of 2000, he had been approached uh, by uh, someone on behalf of uh, Jonathan Pollard. Pollard had not had any serious legal representation since 1992, when the Second Circuit, when the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals uh, had denied his uh, his application uh, to uh, obtain a, a new sentence, the client called me and said he had been approached. Uh, he would. Uh, be interested in putting together a legal defense fund, regardless of what it would cost. 
but he did not want to throw uh, good money after bad. So he asked if, if I would look at the case uh, and if I thought the case was worth taking, he would establish a legal defense fund provided I agreed to take the case. So my partner Jacques Semmelman and I pulled the entire file of the case from the courthouse in the District of Columbia. We looked at it. We basically concluded that because the statute of limitations for a collateral attack had uh, run out in 1997 as a result of a statutory change effective in 1996, any judicial remedy was uphill. But uh, we thought uh, because Pollitt had been so poorly treated that by bringing a legal proceeding to lay out in specific detail the injustices that had been created, we might have some chance at winning in court, but we would uh, renew public opinion to appreciate the injustice uh, that uh, had occurred with Pollard's uh, sentence. Uh, and that might uh, help us uh, with President Clinton, who was outgoing uh, in, 2000, in 2001, uh, or with future a political endeavor. So that's how we got involved. I told my client after we looked at the file, we think there's a, uh, a, a campaign that can uh, legitimately raise uh, expectation among the serious legal and serious Jewish community to assist Pollard, but he should not put a legal defense fund together. Now, I felt the right thing to do uh, was for us to take this case on pro bono uh, and and represent uh, Jonathan um, without uh, fee. And and did you then pursue the case? What was the what was then the next move? What did so what did you do? so first um, we went down. We met with Jonathan. We were retained. We explained to Jonathan uh, our evaluation of what had happened. We went through the injustices that had occurred, the fact that his original lawyer had failed to challenge the government's breach of the plea agreement in various ways, that not only did he fail to challenge the breach of the plea agreement, he failed even to file a one-page notice of appeal. Uh, mm -hmm. And as a result, when Pollard obtained new counsel, they were unable to uh, take uh, a challenge that what we would call a direct challenge, they had to take a collateral challenge. And when that finally went to the circuit court in 1992, before just judges Silberman, Williams, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the issue of uh, whether or not the plea agreement had been breached uh, was now judged under a much more severe standard. Ordinarily, ordinarily, uh, if if you prove that a plea agreement with the government has been breached, you're entitled to a new sentence. It's like any contract, a civil contract or a contract with the government. But if you're challenging it on an indirect or a so-called collateral attack, it's not enough to prove that the government breached the plea agreement. You have to prove that there was a fundamental miscarriage of justice. And at that point, Maybe, maybe just, I think it would be helpful, I guess, working backwards. Yeah. So I think for, for people on, on this call, let, let's hear what he was convicted for um, and, and then. Fine. I, I think if you'll permit me, you know, I will, let me briefly run through the highlights of, of the case. So people will okay. have a, le a level playing field to appreciate how to evaluate uh, what he did um, uh, and the role played by, by Israel, the United States, uh, and uh, people can form their own uh, views. The story begins in 1981. Uh, Israel, uh, uh, without any uh, notice to the United States, bombed the Old Sirach nuclear reactor uh, that was under construction in Saddam Hussein's Iraq. At that time, uh, it being very uh, soon after uh, the hostages were released uh, from the American embassy in Tehran. The Reagan administration, which generally was pro-Israel, uh, 
had been favoring Saddam Hussein against uh, Iran. And as a result of the Osirak reaction, uh, the, the bombing of the Osirak reactor, the Reagan administration felt it had to punish Israel and it reneged on an agreement that Henry Kissinger had brokered between Syria and Israel in 1974, when Israel withdrew from portions of the Golan Heights and gave up its surveillance uh, ability. Uh, in exchange, Kissinger promised uh, various uh, uh, intelligence uh, data as well as satellite data that at the time was unavailable uh, to Israel. This information was now pulled by the Reagan administration in reaction to uh, Israel bombing the reactor. Jonathan Pollard was working in naval intelligence at the time. He was a committed Zionist. He had spent time at the Weizmann Institute in Rehovot. Uh, and he became uh, concerned that Israel being deprived of these uh, of the of, of the the information on Arab capabilities posed an existential threat to Israel. As a result, in 1984, uh, he attended um, a reception at which Aviam Sela was present. Sela was one of the Israeli pilots who had participated in the uh, bombing. He approached Sela. He volunteered to provide uh, information to Israel, the, the information that was being you know, withheld. Uh, and uh, over the next uh, year and a half, uh, on a number of occasions, he provided documents uh, to the Israelis who copied the documents, returned them to Pollard. Eventually, Pollard's activity was discovered. He was confronted. He was arrested and put in solitary confinement on November 21, 1985. He then began a 15-month period of uh, negotiating with the government uh, over a plea agreement. He was represented by a lawyer named Richard Hybe, who grew up in Utica with the Zogbys and is of Lebanese extraction. Uh, on May 23, 1986, Pollard and the U.S. government reached a written plea agreement in which the U.S. agreed to do three things. A, not to seek a life sentence, B, to bring his cooperation to the attention of the sentencing judge uh, and emphasize the positive elements of the cooperation. And three, that at the allocution, that is in the, the sentencing process itself, they would limit their comments to the facts and circumstances of this crime and not engage in any type of character assassination or analysis of Pollard. On June 4, Pollard pleaded guilty. Uh, by the way, he was charged with providing defense information uh, to an ally. There are two sections to the operative, operative statute. One involves providing information with the intent to harm the United States. And Pollard was never charged, and the government never claimed that he intended to harm the United States. He, was, he pleaded guilty on June 4, 1986, and he was sentenced on March 4, 1987. Oh, March, excuse me, just was, yeah, was, that, yeah. was that acceptance of that also to avoid a life sentence and also something to do with his then wife, Ann Pollard, to, that she would not be tried? Is that, is that true? Part of the part of the agreement was uh, Anne would receive uh, a lesser sentence, but the fundamentals right. as they relate to to and that was not breached. So focusing on the three elements of the set of the agreement that were breached, uh, the 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 most important aspect of it was the government was entitled to seek a significant sentence, but they could not ask the judge for the maximum, which was life. Right. The day before the sentence, this will just take a few more minutes. The day before the sentence, Secretary of Defense Caspar Weinberger submitted an unclassified supplemental declaration uh, in which he compared Pollard uh, to three spies, Walker, Whitworth, and Pelton, who had spied for Russia and in 1985 were. Uh, convicted and sentenced to life in prison for providing what was described at the time 
nuclear war winning capabilities to the Soviets. Weinberger in this declaration the day before the sentence said, in the year of the spy, I can't imagine anyone who committed greater harm than Jonathan Pollard. And he should be sentenced commensurate with the harm that he caused. So while Weinberger, uh, whose mother was Lutheran and was not Jewish, did not know Karl Bechomer, he, you know, both he and the sentencing judge clearly understood the argument that Weinberger was making. If Walker, Whitworth, and Pelton received life in prison and Pollard committed more harm than they did, which was not true, then I, and, and Pollard should be sentenced commensurate with the harm, the rest was history. He was sentenced to life in prison uh, and um, went off to, to prison. His lawyer, uh, as we pointed out to Jonathan when we met with him, failed to object to the government's breach of the plea agreement, failed to challenge or demand proof that in fact his harm was more severe than the three spies for Russia when it clearly was not by virtue of the government's own victim impact statement, failed to challenge the government's uh, diminution of his cooperation uh, and failed to challenge the fact that the government engaged in character assassination rather than limit the allocution to the facts and circumstances. And to top it all off, despite all these breaches, he did not file a notice of appeal. Thus, when the case went up with another, with another law, law firm uh, and uh, Ted Olson, the former solicitor general argued the appeal Ted was, was forced to try to convince the three judges that there had been a fundamental miscarriage of justice. Silverman and Ginsburg, uh, each of whom wanted to be appointed to the Supreme Court, if you will, uh, found that the government never used the life word and therefore they found that the plea agreement was not breached. Judge Williams in a 10 page dissent essentially, and, and quoting the witches in Macbeth to demonstrate his revulsion for what the majority had concluded, uh, found that indeed uh, Weinberger, Weinberger's declaration was a flagrant breach of the plea agreement. Uh, and this was a fundamental miscarriage of justice and Pollard deserved to be resentenced before a district judge. Um, now, we got in the case and we, we filed a motion in September of 2000, essentially arguing that Pollitt had been deprived of effective assistance of counsel because of what the counsel had failed to do. Uh, and in order to get around the statute of limitations for collateral attacks, uh, we argued that Paula did not appreciate or even know that he had these rights, the right to, to, to seek uh, a hearing on, on whether or not uh, the, the harm that he caused was greater or not. So we filed this act, this motion. Uh, we, we also visited the White House and made a presentation there. Uh, and we were quite optimistic actually in January of 2000, uh, Oh, one, Elie Wiesel, may you rest in peace, called me and he said, I just left the president, he's going to do it. And then uh, on January, uh, the evening of January 20, uh, the list came out and Jonathan was not there. Uh, let me fast forward now to 2015, because the intervening period involved multi a multitude of applications to figures uh, uh, and and trying every which way to to achieve a political uh, result uh, for clemency, uh, even as the Israelis tried on their end. Uh, in July of 2015, we approached the government. We said that Pollard should get out on parole unless you're prepared to argue that he is likely to continue to divulge confidential information. Uh, and the government wrote us the letter acknowledging that 
they would not take that position. As a result, Pollard was released on parole. But the government had one additional trick up its sleeve. The parole came with these very onerous restrictions. Uh, curfew, GPS monitoring, can't leave Manhattan. Uh, if he uses the internet or gets a job, anyone who hires him has to allow the government to freely uh, go through their electronic system. We challenged these restrictions uh, and um, uh, both Brennan and Clapper, this was the Obama administration, came in and they said some of this information that Paul had accessed is still confidential and therefore it is possible, even though it's not probable, it's possible he might still divulge this information. Uh, and the Second Circuit Court of Appeals essentially said we can't do anything if the government says that it is possible. In July of 2020, we now reminded the same uh, attorneys within the Justice Department that parole should end after five years unless the government was prepared to say now after 35 years that Pollard would, would cause uh, additional damage by violating a criminal statute. We heard nothing from them. We asked them again in November. We had radio silence, but we, we, we essentially said to them, you know as well as we do, that if you don't get us the certificate by Friday, we will be going to court on Monday, uh, essentially asking the court to require uh, the parole commission to hold an immediate hearing uh, because there's absolutely no way you can meet the standard of probable, probable, probably going to commit a new crime. So that brings us current. Um, a lot of other uh, things were done in the interim. Only one other thing I will mention. Uh, there is a statute that, a, a treaty that permits a, an Israeli national, and Pollard was made a citizen of Israel in the early 90s, permits an Israeli national or a national of any country who's convicted of a crime in the United States to serve out the remainder of the sentence, in this case, in Israel. Uh, and we had the approval of uh, Justice Minister Ayala Shaked and uh, Gilad Erdan, who was in charge of the prison system at the time. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, the Department of Justice uh, denied uh, that application. So as a result, we had to run out the five years and here we are. So that may have taken a bit longer, but I think now everyone can understand why uh, we feel there was great injustice in this case. And so Elias, can I just jump in for a second? Because this is yes. so helpful to, to for us. Just, you know, some of the things that float around, which make it harder for people to understand is that, you know, the way that you presented it is that you know, here's a man who is ideologically trying to assist an ally. There are allegations out there that, you know, he was peddling information for money to other countries as well, Argentina, South Africa, and so on. And, you know, there, there are allegations about non-disclosure, uh, non-disclosures that were breached during the court case. You know, were those during those after the court case? Was that before the miscarriage of justice? Just understand a little bit for the, the, lay, the lay people who hear these things. So he was never charged, uh, never charged. And the government never claimed that he gave information to any other country. All right. Um, so that's that's the, the long and the short of it. Number two, with respect to uh, providing uh, the disclosure, Pollard was incommunicado in solitary confinement uh, in a local prison in the District of Columbia awaiting sentence. The government allowed Wolf Blitzer, who was then the Washington bureau chief for the Jerusalem Post, to interview Pollard in prison. Blitzer wrote an article, and the government then claimed at the sentence that Pollard had breached his agreement not to talk to the press by arranging this interview. And incredibly, the lawyer essentially said, I agree, he shouldn't have done that. When Jacques and I got involved in the case, one of the arguments that we made to the district court and the court of appeals uh, in 
2001 and 2003 is this is truly absurd and and it, it was an incredible setup and disingenuous for the government to blame Pollard for for doing the interview with Blitzer, you could not simply walk into this maximum security prison and say, hi, I'm Wolf, I'm Wolf Blitzer. I'm here to interview Mr. Pollard. Every time anyone ever met with Pollard, uh, a representative of the intelligence community was there and no one could enter that prison prior to Pollard's sentence without the government approval. So that, in that sense, Pollard was was duped and then let down by his lawyer. Just people understand uh, this same lawyer many years later uh, turned up as counsel for the Palestinian Authority defending one of the uh, cases uh, brought on behalf of victims of Arab terror. So you want to understand the the failure here uh, it was not simply, I'm not simply criticizing another lawyer, uh, Monday morning quarterbacking. So if, let's, if you would maybe switch over to the Israeli perspective on all this, because that too has undergone a lot of uh, twists and turns along the way. I remember um, whenever it was, I guess, back in the early 80s, I, I and uh, two other rabbis visited Jonathan in in Marion. Mm -hmm. By the way, I don't know. I don't know if you were ever in Marion, in like the eighth floor below ground, and within six feet of his cell was Walker. And I'm looking at this little sort of Nebuch Jewish guy, and I'm 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 shaking in my boots, knowing that this fellow Walker is, you know, uh, right there with me. So, and and he was obviously a very sympathetic fellow. He seemed, he came across as very, um, I would say, Tamimus Dick, as, you know, very wholesome. And yet, uh, from from the Israel side, there certainly wasn't this uh, great embrace early on uh, of him. And even to this day, I mean, I, I read, uh, I believe, last week, um, a former prime minister of Israel, not the current one. The current one has, has really embraced him, but before that, many of the prime ministers were not particularly uh, warm to the idea of uh, welcoming Jonathan to Israel. Uh, I think it was Omer who said, I'm glad he's out, but let him stay in New York. He made a lot of money off of us, something to that effect. So how so do you me, respond to that? So let me address that in two parts. I think, um, I think for Israel, um, in retrospect, I think Israel has great misgivings as to Rafi Eitan's decision uh, to, to uh, engage Jonathan uh, and to uh, compromise Jonathan by offering him money because when Jonathan started, he was a pure Zionist volunteer. Uh, and in retrospect, uh, unquestionably, the fact that Israel had um, used an American uh, to, to basically provide confidential information or, or spy uh, on America for Israel, created a serious um, uh, rift uh, in the relationship between the U.S. or segments of the U.S. and Israel uh, because of, of, the, of the exercise. I think it's unfair to Jonathan, though, uh, you know, for him to bear the br blame. He he bore the brunt of of this error in judgment by a very sophisticated uh, Rafi Eitan, uh, and I'm I'm not I'm not I'm not saying that he acted with bad intentions. I think he himself would probably acknowledge he's no longer with us would acknowledge that if he could if he could hit the reset button he would not have done it that that the information was important but he, he did not he did not carry through or work through the implications of what happens if if there is a um, 
if Jonathan is caught. But well, wasn't there really were um, a, a undertones or maybe more than undertones of tension in terms of the American defense system and the Israelis as to the sharing of information. I mean, it, it's not, you know, back in those days, in the 80s, 90s even, you know, there, there, was, there was not this uh, sort of close relationship that we have now and have had for a while, you know? So I think that what, what bothered a lot of people was the notion, why we, you know, why was Israel in effect betraying its relationship with America? I think it's a very good question, but I think the, the, to answer the second part of your question with respect to Eyal Omer, I think Prime Minister Omer uh, uh, is being somewhat disingenuous in uh, casting uh, blame Jonathan's way uh, when the blame belongs entirely to Israel. And in fact, Eyal Omer, who's so critical of this operation, was as prime minister had Rafi Eitan in his cabinet. Now he didn't. He doesn't mention that in this 2020 um, uh, op-ed piece. He's he's taking a pot shot at a man who basically spent 35 years instead of three or five or seven years because of a bungled operation that was bungled by the Israelis. And, and there's no question that this incident, this episode created uh, tension. But Jonathan shouldn't be the one who's blamed for it. He acted in good faith. He acted because he genuinely believed Israel was in danger. And he paid the price 35 years. So when looking at that price, you know, looking from the outside, it's, it's hard to know, you know, is this is this because his case was treated as an example, sort of, you know, to 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 scare any future offenders? Or is this always an element of perhaps, you know, some people have this feeling that there's always this anti-Semitism, which is in, in um, a part of the establishment. It's, it's, you know, hard to know from the outside, but your perspective on that. I think it's hard to say this is anti-Semitism. I, I think it's a lot easier to say uh, there was clearly a sense among the uh, intelligence community in the United States that uh, America, who from America's perspective had done so much for Israel, was betrayed by Israel. Uh, and uh, the the... Jonathan is really a pawn here. In other words, he's the one that's suffering because at the end of the day, the, the geopolitical uh, situation far transcends uh, this particular tension in the relationship. Uh, and we see today how incredibly uh, robust the relationship is. Uh, but I, I think, I mean, I, I, I know uh, during the Bush years, uh, you know, half of the... Um, uh, people I spoke to uh, uh, were very pro Jonathan because they felt he had done his time, but others like Donald Rumsfeld basically felt uh, no sympathy um, because of the betrayal. I don't think they would they and and so it, it's it's easy to say anti-Semitism, but to some extent Israel has a unique relationship. Uh, uh, with the United States. And back in the 1980s and 1990s, it was much more of a dependency uh, where today it's still relatively, it, it's not an equal, uh, on an equal right. par with, with America, but uh, the re relationship is clearly much more mature, much more robust. Plus, I think also, uh, I remember there was a a very well-known, uh, what was it, a, a memorandum of understanding, I believe, back in the 80s, you know, which was between the the Pentagon and, and Israeli security. And and there was a great sense in Israel uh, that America was not necessarily sharing uh, 
all of the information that, that Israel felt it should be getting. So in, in that environment, you know, so Jonathan emerges and, and it sort of makes some sense that therefore, even if, if Rafi Eitan, you know, is maybe going a little rogue, it's, we need to do it because we, we can't necessarily trust the defense system in America to provide and share. Right. Yeah. And, and, and I think people don't realize that because they're looking at it sort of, you know, 2020 hindsight that today, you know, we, we are, you know, we can dive in Mincha on the White House lawn, you know, so. Uh, I, I also think that um, you know, those Jewish uh, uh, scientists and professionals working in the intelligence community who live in the Washington area, who live in Virginia, who live in um, uh, Maryland, uh, felt that um, uh, Jonathan's um, uh, acts uh, had um, created a cloud uh, on, uh, on them. You know, to what extent uh, or whether that in fact is the case, I don't know, but, but certainly uh, in, in all of the uh, interactions that, uh, that I've had over the 20 years dealing with Washingtonians, uh, some of whom were Jewish, uh, you know, many- Awkward. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there, for, for some, it was very awkward. For some said, look, I felt that it had a direct effect on, on me and, and my advancement uh, in, in, in government. But again, don't think you can blame Jonathan, who was basically uh, in his late 20s, uh, impetuous, uh, but, but sincere, uh, and uh, Israel ran this operation. And it also, I think, reflects that, uh, and again, today may be different, but there's always been a kind of uh, feeling, at least that I've had, that there's this wall around the defense establishment of America. You know, the Pent- like you we were quoting some of those people from the Pentagon, that they have to protect America, and this was an assault by a quote unquote friend that betrayed us. And, and I think there's still plenty of people who, who are, have, are not comfortable with that. No, I agree. I just think, I think the, the real impetus for the punishment is to make a point to Israel. Mm-hmm. But Jonathan Pollard happened to be the vehicle by which that point was made. So, uh, right. just, just to jump into this, so just a couple of audience questions which came through while we're talking. Yes. It is, um, you know, so you, you pointed towards the lawyers, his representation falling short in the initial court cases. You know, were, were, first of all, were, were they court appointed? How did he arrive at the, that defense, that counsel? Number two is what would have been if there was been like sliding doors of history? If you had better, would there have been another alternative at that point in time? Could there have been an appeal which would have been effective? Um. Several very good questions. Jonathan's arrested. He gets his phone call. He calls his father, who was a famous scientist uh, at Notre Dame, uh, called his father. And, Originally from Texas. Yes, yes. Right. Jonathan was born, I think, in Galveston. Born in Texas, right, in Galveston. Um, called his father. He said, Dad, I, I was arrested. Uh, I need a lawyer that, uh, that does this type of uh, criminal law. Um, his father turned to the dean, and the dean said, I know a guy named James Hybe, uh, and um, he's a former assistant U.S. attorney, and James Hybe had a brother, Richard Hybe, and James ended up representing uh, Jonathan's wife, Ann Pollard, and Richard Hybe, otherwise pronounced Hybe, uh, ended up uh, representing uh, Jonathan. Israel paid for the legal services. I think here, Israel was in this, I don't know what the right f- frame of, of mind is, whether it's traumatized or confused or conflicted, uh, but surely uh, there must have been at least one solid Jewish lawyer 
in New York or Washington available to take the case. Uh, and, and for Israel to essentially allow these two hybees to represent Anne and Jonathan, uh, it, it certainly seems that while they were paying, they were not paying attention. Because if someone had been paying attention, they would have at least been, they, they would have at least taken steps to ensure that Hybe filed a notice of appeal. And if not Hybe, someone else, Jonathan could have filed it on his own. So I, I think, I think that, that's the beginning of, of part of the abandonment of Jonathan in the early years. In effect, they, were ne they didn't abandon, they, they never really were willing to claim him. There was there was this, this sort of game being played that uh, you know this was maybe a rogue a rogue operation uh, that was taking place as well. What I want to I want to get a what your thoughts are on um, there is a I think there is a it's a naval intelligence uh, group of four William Studman Sumner Shapiro John Butts and Thomas Brooks. Um, so apparently their, their formulation of how the opposition, in other words, to let him, let him get out uh, earlier or, or whenever, is one, that Pollard pled guilty and the American people never came to know some things that he did. For example, they say that he offered classified information to three other countries before working for the Israelis, that he offered his services to a fourth country while he was spying for Israel. And they also never came to understand that he was being highly paid for his services. So, and there's, there's more, uh, you know, criticism of him, but I'm saying, I think that's some of the backdrop, maybe just to, how would you address that? Well, I think as I said, uh, I can primarily deal with what the government charged or what the government brought up at the allocution. Uh, had, he, had he attempted to, had, he, had in fact the government felt that he had actually attempted to uh, sell confidential defense information to others, uh, whether that was charged or not, it would have been brought up uh, at sentence. It was not. It was neither charged nor brought up at sentence because, frankly, uh, there's no crime. There's no in exactly, and there's no indication that that occurred. Right. Uh, second, right. the amount of money, something like thirty thousand dollars over a two-year period, was not something that Pollard asked for. It was mm -hmm. something that Rafi Eitan concluded was necessary to sort of bring Pollard into the team uh, and. Mm -hmm. And essentially, uh, uh, you know, that, that also helped to undo Pollard because it hurt him at sentence. There would have been at least more sympathy if he didn't have the money aspect. And the government focused on the fact that he made money. But that's also an unfair truth in that case because the amount of money was all uh, planned and, uh, and uh, uh, orchestrated by Rafi Eitan and the Lakam group. And would you say he was really quite naive? Certainly back in those early days, he was, it was more of an, a, trying to just, Dan Lakavskus, that he was trying to help Israel and probably did not fully realize the ramifications of, of what he was doing. I think he, he probably realized the ramifications that he was violating his oath and that right. if caught, he, he would pay a price, but uh, he was trusting. Uh, mm -hmm. I think naive might be the wrong word. Uh, I, I think many of us who have such a strong emotional connection to Israel, as Jonathan does and did, uh, very often when we're approached about a crisis in Israel or a need for funds, uh, we want to believe. And there's a lot less cross-examination, if you will, because it involves Israel uh, and it involves our people. And, and I think that's the best way to, to sort of transpose and appreciate Jonathan's state of mind. 
He wants to help Israel. He knows he's taking a grave risk, but he feels it's worth taking in order to provide this information to Israel. And what about those other countries? Is that, I mean, even though it may not have been charged, do you, do you know anything about whether he did that? I don't believe that he actually ever did that. I think there are some uh, um, indications that, that he talked about things like that because he, he did, he was somewhat garrulous, but there is no evidence in the file, no indication in any of the, the documents that we've seen and never raised by the government at any of the situations where we would ask for a reduction in parole or ask, or at our first parole hearing, which was prior to the one that we succeeded, this never came up. And, and if in fact he was a recidivist, so to speak, that clearly is something that, that uh, the government would always point out in a criminal case. The government never mentioned any of these other uh, countries. Uh, and um, the emphasis was always on, on what he did uh, with Israel. They would, have, they would have brought that up if that was part of the case, certainly. Sure, for yeah. sure. I just sort of, Elliot, just to take another angle at this, you know, so you talked about how you did this pro bono. And can you just give us a sense of the years, the amount of hours of money, and, and also the relationship that your firm, a leading law firm, had to this case, which you took on as a leader? It's probably as complicated as um, the case uh, itself. Uh, we have probably run up four to five million dollars in legal fee value uh, and probably another half a million, three quarters of a million uh, on expenses for briefs, for travel, for, for whatnot. Uh, my firm is an international law firm. We're heavily based in the Middle East. Uh, we have offices in the United Arab Republic. We have offices in Oman. Um, we represent uh, virtually every oil and gas producing um, country in the United States, in, in the world, uh, outside of uh, Russia and the United States. We're heavily involved uh, in the Middle East as a firm. Uh, so um, I, I think my firm deserves tremendous credit uh, for uh, treating this as a pro bono criminal case uh, and notwithstanding the fact that surely there must have been um, uh, clients at the early stages for sure in the Arab world uh, who, who uh, were not fans of um, Israel or fans of Jonathan Pollard. But, but we took the case on and we thought it was an appropriate case for us. I, it, I think it, it was a case that, that reeked of injustice uh, and uh, it was, it's the kind of case that, uh, that we in our litigation group have handled um, you know, just a few years before my late partner, Peter Fleming had represented um, uh, in California on a pro bono basis, the last individual who was actually executed uh, in California. Uh, that was also a very difficult uh, case, uh, and uh, it's part of part of uh, serving the bar in the United States. I believe, and my partners believe, in the integrity of the judicial system. And to be honest, neither I nor anyone else anticipated it would go on for as long as it did, uh, or that uh, we would. Uh, expend as much uh, time and effort as we did, but but uh, I never received uh, any um, uh, criticism or or uh, second guessing uh, uh, by the firm. They stood by us, uh, and Jacques and I were able to staff up as we needed staffing, whether it was emergency basis or otherwise, uh, and uh, we spent uh, as we needed to spend the same way we would for a large uh, um, multinational corporation. Elika Vogt, beautiful. Can, can you tell us a little bit, I know his wife is not well, what, what the plans are or they're pretty much, uh, the plan I, I assume is hopefully to get to Israel Yes. when she's well or well enough to travel, is that the goal? Right, I think there are two elements to the, uh, the health issue. One is to uh, 
you know, make sure that, um, you know, they've identified the right uh, uh, medical team in Israel uh, that um, can coordinate with the medical team here and pick up on the chemotherapy and whatever else she needs. Uh, and two, that she is physically able to make uh, the trip. Uh, they hope uh, they're, they're working on the logistics as we speak. Uh, and uh, I, I think their intentions are to uh, make, make plans, uh, get settled, uh, and make Aliyah to go home to uh, Israel. You know, Elliot, could you, could you help us? You know, I, I know you mentioned to me that, you know, there's a, there's a great interest in the course of the last week, certainly from the Israeli news agencies you know, and, and community. And there's a little less so here. Can you speak to sort of the degree of um, apathy and indifference on this side of the Atlantic and maybe contrast that with your, your passion, your willingness to take this through to its conclusion? How, how are we as bystanders, what, what should our perspective be when it comes to issues of complexity of this nature? Well, first, I have found that certainly within what I will call the Torah community, whether it's the Zionist, religious Zionist community or the yeshivish community, uh, by and large, um, they're, they're at, at least in terms of the recognition that I've received and the interest that I get from, from people at Simchas or encountering them throughout the year. There's tremendous interest and tremendous identification with Jonathan as a fellow Jew who is uh, serving in prison or was serving uh, unjust, unjustly past a certain period of time. There are many Jews, including some observant Jews and Jews in our community as well, who are observant and who are lovers of Zion, who don't share that passion in this particular case. And I think that's understandable. Uh, it's, it's a complex case. And if you look at it from the angle of the injustice done one man, it's hard not to be sympathetic. If you look at the mess that was created uh, as it relates to, uh, to Israel, um, you can understand people feeling that the better, better that this case had never happened. Uh, Hope that answers at least some of your question. You've, you've answered them all very beautifully. This has been a real, um, I think, uh, enlightening uh, 55 minutes. And uh, we really are very grateful to you. Uh, thank and, you. And I want to thank Rabbi Trump for uh, joining me in this. Rabbi, do you want to send us off? You know, uh, it's, just been, it's a pleasure. I just want to also appreciate just First of all, it's so nice to be able to communities to come together. You know, we're we're just down the street. It's so nice to be able to continue to do things together. We share right. so so much, and firstly, my greatest respect for an individual who's led communities to the level where we're at today. Um, and you know, I think that the mitzvah of Pidyon Shuim is a very uncommon mitzvah which we have witnessed unfolding in our very in front of our very eyes. And I think it's not to be lost at this moment of how important, how precious this is. And Elliot, you know, one of the things which you said to me, and I think this is something perhaps you can just close with this, is, is the idea of seeing it through, of the idea of ensuring that something goes to its full end. Five years ago, he was out. You could have at that point in time. Can you, and I, I, would, I want to add actually, you and Marilyn, because <laughs> so this, is, this is really a, a, a family, this is a family that cares. Can you just get perhaps what we can walk away with? We as the as the, the folks on the outside, can you just share that message, your perspective of why this was so important? No, I, I appreciate that. Uh, I, I think there are two elements to it. A, I think the case itself is very important because it it was a situation in which we needed to stand up for a fellow Jew and not be embarrassed to stand up for a fellow Jew and not be embarrassed to stand up for a fellow Jew, even in a case that is not black and white. 
because most cases are not black and white. Here's a situation where a fellow Jew past a certain point was unjustly treated and deserved to have communal support. So in that sense, uh, I was very proud uh, that uh, I uh, and, and Jacques and the firm committed to see this through. But as I've said um, privately, I'm probably most proud of the fact that we never gave up, that um, uh, it's extremely important uh, for we Jews, the, the carriers of the torch of the Masorah, uh, who, who go back thousands and thousands of years and will continue you know, for thousands and thousands of years, never to give up, to stick to it. Uh, and one of the things I'm most proud of, and I tell that to the children and grandchildren, I'm most proud that we never stopped trying one way or the other to bring justice to Jonathan. And that's and, important here. And it's important in everything that we do, whether it's for Israel, for our community, uh, for the sake of Yadut. Never give up uh, uh, and always stick to it. Absolutely. And you've taught us. You really have. You and Jacques. To save one Jew is the greatest a Jew, a Jew can do. And uh, we're very, very grateful. Very thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Truly an inspiration. Thank you, Elias. Thank you, Rabbi. Have a good night. Good week.